you have your Bibles, we're going to just look at one passage of Scripture um, and just really as a stepping stone into what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, we are in the middle of a series called Rooted, just growing deeper in our walk with Jesus. And we're looking at just what are the things that will enable us to grow in our walk with Jesus? What are the things that will um, enable us to be what God has called us to be? Um, and so as we're studying this series, it's a little bit more topical. I'm normally... Um, as a church, we typically take a book of the Bible and we just go passage by passage. But this series has been a little different where we're going, jumping all over scriptures, going to different parts and just studying. And today is going to be one of those as well. We're going to look at one passage simply to step us into where we're going. And that's going to be Philippians 4, um, verses 4 through 9. Um, Philippians 4, 4 through 9. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say to you, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. What you have learned, what you have received, what you have heard, what you have seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. July 1961, 38 members of the Green Bay Packers football team gathered together for the first day of training camp. The previous season ended as the Packers were in the NFL championship game. This is before the Super Bowl. And they squandered a lead at the last few minutes and lost to the Philadelphia Eagles. You should have known that. Um, and um, they lost the game. And so their coach, Vince Lombardi, addressed the group of professional players um, on the first day of training camp. They come within minutes of winning the big prize. and. On the first day of training camp, Lombardi stood in front of the group, and he pulls out a football, and he says, gentlemen, this is a football. Think about it. They, they had just lost the championship by a few points, and he begins at the basics. This is a football. And he started with the fundamentals and covered the fundamentals of the playbook, starting from page one. And in the middle of it, one of his all-pro receivers, uh, Max McGee, who raises his hands and he says, Coach, could you slow down just a little bit because you're going way too fast for us. And Lombardi continued and smiled at him. He continued with the basics. Six months later, the Packers defeated the Green Bay Giants, I mean the New York Giants, 37-0, to zero, sorry, sorry, Paul, to win the NFL championship. By the way, side note, I think this is what the Cowboys are going to do tomorrow morning after tonight's game um, against the Eagles as well. Um, there are some things in life that are just basic. And it's easy to think that these things don't matter. But the truth is that nothing is more important than the basics of our faith. Every follower of Jesus needs to master the core gospel habits that will keep them growing for a lifetime. We never move beyond these things. I've noticed in conversations that often I'll talk to someone and they'll complain that the core habits of our faith are just too basic. They're just too simple. And usually when you press into them and you ask them, you discover that they don't even practice the basics consistently. They would like to move on to something more deeper or something more advanced without mastering or being mastered by the basics of our faith. I've also noticed that the more I talk to believers that are mature, people that are godly in their faith, people that are strong in their faith, their eyes light up, and they feel like they're just getting started with the basics. They, they don't know how to pray. They don't know how to read the Bible. There's a, one of my favorite authors is a guy named Sinclair Ferguson, who's a um, professor um, at Westminster, um, um, pastor, I think, in Carolina right now. But someone, um, his publishing company came to him and asked him, hey, could you um, write a book on prayer? And he goes, I'm not qualified to write a book on prayer. I don't, I still struggle with prayer. And he gave him a list of godly men. He was like, these are guys who should write. And the publisher looked at him and smiled and said, we've already asked them. And they told us to ask you, right? Those who are growing, those who are maturing, um, 
they never feel like they've got it. They never feel like they've attained it. They're still passionately in love with Jesus. They're still pursuing Jesus. They want more of Jesus. And in our text, don't miss what Paul is saying here. He says, do these things that you've learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. And if you do this, a God of peace will be with you. Don't miss this. When we build our lives on biblical content, it's vital because it will result in the very presence of God in our lives, the very presence of the God of peace in our lives. And verse 8 says, or verse 9 says, these things you should practice. Practice these things. Make them a part of your life. Make them habits. We've been talking about habits the last couple of weeks. Make these things, things that you do consistently, that they become part of the rhythm of your life. And so no matter how much we'll grow, we'll never grow beyond these three basics, gospel habits. I want to just look at three things this morning that I think are the core things that we need to have so that we could grow in our walk with Jesus. Now again, some of you, this is going to be like, this is something you've heard over and over. But can I just encourage you, be refreshed in this. Um, Sometimes it's so easy to hear something and say, oh, that's not for me, that's for someone else. But these are things that we need, right? I mean, these are things that we all need so that we can grow and mature. So the first habit is engaging in Scripture. Reading or listening to absorb the Bible is crucial for spiritual growth. Donald Whitney is a leading author on the spiritual disciplines, done some phenomenal writings on the disciplines of our faith. He said that no spiritual discipline is more important than the intake of God's Word. Nothing can substitute for it. There is simply no healthy Christian life apart from the diet of a milk and meat of Scripture. George Mueller, we know him as a man of faith because he started an orphanage and every day he would have to pray, ask God to provide for the meals for the next day. And by faith, God would always provide, because of his faith and because of his prayers, God would always show up through different people the next day and provide for the kids. But we talk a lot about his prayer life, but in regards to the importance of God's word, Mueller said the vigor of our spiritual life, the excitement of our spiritual life, the passion for our spiritual life, will always be in direct proportion to the place that the Bible holds in our lives. How passionate you are about Jesus will always be at the same proportion to how much this word holds, the value this word holds in your life. And we know this is true. Jesus himself affirmed the scriptures of the Bible when he quoted passages after passages from the Old Testament, especially in those moments when he was fighting against temptation and the enemy um, to the devil, he said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That what sustains us, that what energizes us, what encourages us, what motivates us is the word of God. Every spiritually mature person I've ever met has a regular intake of God's word in their lives. It's a priority for them. But the truth is that despite the importance of reading or listening to God's word, most of us haven't developed this habit. A study found that self-identified Christians did not read or engage with the Bible much more than non-Christians in general. Only one in five Christians reflect on the meaning of the Bible just a few times a week. We're not reading the Bible, much less reading it well. If you ask 100 church members if they read the Bible today, 84 of them will say no. Ask them if they read the Bible this week, 68 will say no. Even more disconcerting is that ask 100 church members if reading or studying the Bible has made a significant difference in their walk, in their life, only 37 would say yes. And I'm not saying this to give you a guilt trip. The solution to this is to build a habit of reading or listening to the Bible using the practices for building habits. And friends, fortunately, we live in a golden age of resources for Bible reading. There's videos, there's apps, there's study Bibles, there's Bible reading plans, there's books on how to study the Bible that gives us everything we need to get started. And yet many of us are still intimidated especially if we've ever gotten stuck, right? We make this resolution, we're going to start, and we get stuck, and we get stuck at the same place over and over every year, right around February or March, and it's always 
that third book of the Bible, right? And it's always there that we can't move forward and we ultimately get discouraged. There, so let me just give you just some practical tips um, on creating habits on reading Scripture. Just some practical things on just getting better. Number one, find out why. Find out why. Reading, reading and studying the Bible will take some effort. You'll probably get stuck. You'll probably run into scriptures that are difficult to understand or passages that frustrate you. And so spend some time reflecting on the importance of scripture, even the hard parts. Clarify for yourself why reading or listening to scripture is important. And remember that we cannot follow a God that we don't know if, who he is and what he desires. Reading scripture is essential for growth. Remind yourself often, keep coming back to these reasons. I'm reading because I want to know God. I'm reading because God has loved me and graciously shown his mercy to me, and I want to know him. Number two, start small. Pick a goal that's realistic. We talked about this last week. It's better to read five minutes a day consistently than 15 minutes a day once a month. Strength the habit until you're confident that you'll be able to practice it consistently at least 80% of the time. Pick a format. Pick a good Bible version that's both accurate that's understandable. If you want to read, pick a good study Bible. Or if you'd like to try something different, something I've been doing this year, is pick up a reader's Bible. A reader's Bible is a Bible that has no verses and no chapters, and you're just reading. You have no idea where to stop or where to end. It's not limited. You just read and just get refreshed by it. You may want to consider picking up an audio Bible, especially if you don't enjoy reading, or if you found yourself bogged down or discouraged in the past. I've personally been enjoying switching from audio to sitting down and reading. I found it helpful for me. Sometimes when I'm driving in the morning, just turn on the Bible app and just listen to the guy um, go really, really slow as he goes through this passage of Scripture. And so it consumes my time. And it's made a huge difference in my life. Because sometimes I can read something, but then if I hear it from someone else, something clicks for me. And so find what works for you. Maybe another thing you can do is read or listen with others. Some of us prefer to be alone. Others do better in group settings, and we'll do better when we read and listen to Scripture with others. Find some friends who want to work through the Bible with you. Set a goal to follow the same plan. Create a text thread. It's just saying, hey, what did you learn from today's passage? Just find people to hold you accountable, encourage you. Invite others to join you, right? I mean, after two or three days of when you're the other people in your group are saying, I read this passage and you haven't, there's a little bit of a guilt trip that forces you to do it, right? I mean, that just motivates you to do it. That's not a bad thing because if ultimately at the end of the day you are growing, do it. There are many reasons for reading Scripture, all of which are good for you. So let me just highlight a few of these things. Reading the Bible shows us God's character. The Bible is our definitive source for the answers to our questions about God. Hebrews 11 says it this way. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times in various ways. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his son who has appointed us heirs of all things through whom he has made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had purified, after he had provided purifications for sins, he sits down at the majesty in heaven. How are you going to know Jesus? It's through the word. How do you know the Father? Through Jesus. Number two, reading the Bible teaches us to be intimate with God. Ephesians 5 says, follow God's example, therefore as dearly loved children. How are you going to follow God's example? How are you going to be a child? How are you going to have childlike faith? Only when you know what God says. Number three, reading the Bible helps us discover what's next for us. Our next step, Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, right? Um, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Imagine if this room was dark and all I had was a flashlight. Let me see if I can pull this off. Uh, flashlight. And if I, you can't see this. Can you guys dim the lights for a second? Oh, still doesn't work. But 
if I had the lights pointing all the way out there, and all I want to see is, God, what's my future? What's my future? I'm going to trip up over this thing, right? Because all I'm doing is looking up there, and I'm trying to see what's out there. But if your word is a lamp to my feet, as I read the word, I see, God, this is where you're growing, wanting me to grow. These are things that you're wanting me to improve on. These are sins that you're confronting me on. What am I doing? I'm addressing this. I'm moving forward. Addressing this. I'm moving forward. Addressing this. I'm moving forward. And pretty soon I'm here where I used to be there. How did I get here? All I did was take one step at a time. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Your word shows me what steps I'm supposed to take. Your word shows me what I'm supposed to do in life. Oftentimes, we, wanna, we want God to tell us, hey, God, where are we going to be a year from now? God, where are we going to be five years from now? God says, you know what? Just take the word. Take one step. Take another step. Take another step. Take another step. Pretty soon we're here. We're like, oh, man, how did I get here? How did God bring me here? All we did was being faithful to the daily voice of God. All we were was just listening to God's voice day in and day out. Hear God's word. Listen to God's word. Read God's word. And he says he will guide you. He will lead you. Number four, the Bible keeps us from sin. Psalm 119, again, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Right? I have discovered those mornings where I spend time with God, it's a lot easier to say no to temptation because your word is in my heart. But those moments when I am rushing and I don't have time, I've discovered those are days I'm a little bit more on edge, a little bit more, on, a little bit more anxious, a little bit more angry, a little bit more frustrated because... I haven't let the words sink in. When I pause and reflect in the morning and say, God, even if I read five verses, even if I just spend a few moments just to say, would you show up in my life? Those days I sense God's presence even more, and there's a, it, there's a strength that God provides to resist sin and temptation in my life. Number five, reading the Bible helps us renew our minds so that we can know God's will. It renews our mind. It refreshes us. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good and pleasing, perfect will. When you know God's word, you'll be able to discern what are things that are from God, what are things that are not from God. Number six, reading the Bible allows us to be certain of what God said. The Bible is our final authority. Jesus' prayer for us before, um, Jesus' final prayer for us was sanctify them by the truth. And what is truth? Your word is truth. Number seven, reading the Bible allows us to receive the desires of our heart. John 15, Jesus, again, um, praying. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. How do you remain in God? You are in the word. Now, listen, I need to clarify this because there's a bunch of people that have taken this verse and twisted it around. If you remain in God, doesn't mean you can ask God for whatever you want and God just pops it to you, right? Um, just shows up and gives it to you. What happens is when you remain in God, God's desires become your desires. And what you pray more than your happiness and satisfaction is, God, through my life, would you be glorified? And at the end of the day, your desire is to hear just a few words from God, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not about how much wealth you've accumulated or what possessions you got or how healthy you are. And I'm not saying God doesn't provide all of those things. He does. But at the end of the day, your desire becomes, God, in my life, would you be honored? Would you be glorified in, in a way that you are pleased? Number eight, reading the Bible is how we learn the gospel. John 5, Jesus says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them that you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. We learn the gospel through the scriptures. We remind ourselves through scriptures how loved we are. 
that, that we are not saved because of good we are, but we are saved because of how good he is. That we are forgiven, that we are accepted, that we are heirs to all of the riches of God's kingdom because of Jesus, not because of us. Number nine, reading the Bible gives us courage. Reading the Bible gives us courage. Listen, the scripture reminds us that he is with you and not against you. The scriptures remind you that he is faithful no matter what you're going through right now. The scriptures remind you of his kindness in your life. The scriptures remind you that even if you're going through a difficult time, that God will work it out for your good and his glory. But you need to know scriptures. Otherwise, you're going to say, God, what are you doing? I don't understand it. The scriptures will encourage you to do that. Joshua 1 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so, and be careful to do everything in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Then you don't have to be afraid. Then you can be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Reading the Word gives you courage. And final thing about Scripture, reading this Bible helps us to be fruitful. It helps us to be fruitful. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the way of the ungodly, sits in the seats of scornful. But it goes on and says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He delights in wanting to hear what God says. He meditates on the law day and night. That person is like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. That person yields fruit. That person is not, it's, it's fruit is good. Listen, I think ultimately at the end of the day, all of us want a life that's fruitful that makes a difference, that makes an impact in the communities that we live in. And Jesus says, if you want that, you need to know the Word. You need to dive into the Word. We can never go past this. You can ask God for all the supernatural gifts and spiritual gifts, but you can never go past this. Reading and listening to God's Word helps us shape our hearts. It helps us see the world differently. It helps us to become accustomed to God's way of life. And friends, yet it's hard. All, many of us struggle to develop this habit even though we understand its importance. Charles Spurgeon said, No one ever outgrows Scripture. The book widens and deepens even more as we dive into it. And I invite you to keep reading. Keep listening. Keep memorizing Scripture. Meditate on it. Figure out what works for you and do it. Don't try to copy someone else because it works for them. You figure out what works best for you. You grow. You mature. It is your life that matters. Don't be like someone else. Be you. Grow in your walk with Jesus. Number two, core habit number two is prayer. The strange thing about prayer is that prayer is that prayer is easy and hard at the same time. It's easy. Anyone can do it, right? My, uh, my five-year-old prayed for us this morning as we were leaving um, the house, and he just prayed, Jesus, help me learn something in kids' church and be with us as we went to church. That's all he prayed. It's easy. And yet, it's often hard. Nobody needs to learn how. The smallest of children can do it. People who don't even believe in the God of Scripture feel compelled to pray, right? I've never met, I rarely have met someone that's refused prayer for their lives. They believe that something can happen in prayer. It's almost like we can't help ourselves. Jared Wilson um, is an author. He said, prayer is almost like acknowledged helplessness, spilling our guts to Jesus. Spilling our guts shouldn't be that hard. The strange thing, though, we know it's hard. It is. I don't know anyone that feels accomplished in prayer. We're all beginners when it comes to praying. And that's good news because it puts us in the right place to learn to pray. The secret to prayer is helplessness. It's acknowledging that you can't do it on your own. And evidence that you have pride in your life is the fact that you don't pray. The fact that you don't go to Jesus. The fact that you think that you can make it through life without him. That's pride. There's a phenomenal book which I would recommend. It's called A Praying Life 
by Paul Miller. Paul Miller, he's done a, such a really good job just talking about the daily habits of prayer. And it's a good, good resource. But he says, prayer is bringing your helplessness to Jesus. The very thing we're allergic to, our helplessness, is what makes prayer work. It works because we're helpless. We cannot do life on our own. And I'm learning that prayer is about coming to God in our helplessness and in the mess of our lives. It means telling God exactly what's on our mind and asking Him for His help. See, the problem is, I want to come to God all put together. I want to come to God saying, God, I did this, I did this. So when I pray, you have to answer me because of what I've done. Right? And so I have to get my life right before I can talk to Jesus. But that's not what Jesus is calling us to do. He says, come just as you are. Come in your brokenness. Come in your struggles. Come when you screw up. I have this thing when we have to discipline our kids. Um, if I'm bringing them to the room to discipline them, after the discipline, I make them pray. Right? Because I don't want them to think that they're going to be perfect on their own. I want them to realize they need Jesus' help even in their struggles of just even basic stuff. I remember one time, Tim, our middle one, was getting in trouble because he was annoying his older sister. And, I, and, and so this is like the fourth or fifth time. And I finally bring him into the room, and he just says, I don't know why I do this. I just can't stop doing it. <laughs> I almost, I try to be serious but not laugh, right? Um, um, but it was such a teaching moment for me. It was like, I'll tell you why you can't do it. Because you're trying, you need Jesus. You, even at a young age, you need Jesus to not do things you're not supposed to do. To do the things you're supposed to do. Right? And even in that young age, it was pointing to him that you are not going to overcome sin just by willpower or mental um, fortitude. You're not going to overcome by reading more um, books on the topic. The only way you're going to overcome things in your life is coming at a point of helplessness and saying, Jesus, I messed up. I need you to show up. Right? And that's the only way we will grow. Come with your temptations. Come with your struggles. Come with your doubts. Come with your anxieties. Come with your failures. Come confessing you don't want to pray. Come as you are. And after all, it is God who invites you to come, right? Um, I've been married 15 years, and my wife says I never say anything good from, about her from up here, so I'm going to say something good for, about her today. So, But <laughs> there are days I wake up in amazement that she is still next to me, right? I mean, in the fact that this woman knows all of my flaws this woman knows all of my sins. This woman knows all of my weaknesses. And yet, when I wake up, she's still there next to me um, every single morning. And it's amazing that she will love me and wants to spend the rest of her life with me. How much more amazing is it that God not only knows what you've done, but he also knows what you think. And yet he still says he loves you. He still says you are his child. That nothing can separate you from Jesus. That he wants to hear from you. That he gives you this image of saying, like a little child, would you just come and tell me what's going on? See, our mistake, our challenge, our problem is that we tend to think of prayer as a duty rather than a delight. We should approach God not because we have to, but because we get to. Because he loves us. He cares for us. He invites us into relationship with him. God actually wants to hear what is on our mind. I found three principles or three practices that help me in my prayer life. Number one, see prayer as a way to manage your life. Paul Miller does a great job talking about this. Prayer is where I do my best work as a husband. Prayer is where I do my best work as a dad, a worker, a friend, a pastor. I actually manage my life through my daily prayer time. I'm shaping my heart, my work, my family. In fact, everything that is dear to me through prayer and fellowship with the Father. I'm doing that because I don't have control over my heart and the life or the hearts and lives of those around me. But I know God does. And so I pray. I think this is what Paul meant in 
Thessalonians when he says pray without ceasing. The idea there isn't just walk around praying all the time. The idea is keep your mind on God. It's not that you just spend all day in formal prayer, but live a life aware of God's presence, interacting with him, inviting him into the daily aspects of your life. Prayer isn't just something we do at a certain time. It, it's meant to permeate our life so that we pray repeatedly. We pray often so that we can say it manages our lives. I told you some of the things I do last week. I've got alerts on my phone just in the middle of the day, 938. Pause. Pray for, pray for people. Pray for laborers to rise up. This morning at 938, my phone buzzed as I was driving here. Prayed for you guys that this week you would be on mission for Jesus, that the people that you come interact with, that you would point them toward Jesus, right? And I've got apps that I use that just remind me, hey, pray for my family. Pray for work. If I save my walk with Jesus for 30 minutes at the end of the day and forget about him throughout the day, it's not helping me. It's not helping me be reminded that my life isn't about me. It's about Jesus. And so throughout the day, there's just little alerts, just little reminders, hey, Pray for your family today. And it doesn't take five minutes. It takes 30 seconds. Father, bless my kids at school. Father, bless our church. Father, bless me at work today to be productive. What am I doing? I'm inviting God into the daily routines of my life, reminding myself that I'm helpless without him. Right? Daily reminders that will help you. Number one. Number two, pray at certain times about certain things. Prayer should be both spontaneous and it should be planned. You will not develop the habit of spontaneous prayer without also learning the discipline of prayer that is structured and regular. I'll just share this, but I found it helpful to pray at certain regular times in the day. Once every day, I spend some time in prayer. I go through the list of things that I have to pray for, things like family, urgent requests, church, work, issues in the world, our country. There's an app called Permate, which regularly prompts me to pray certain times of the day on certain categories. It doesn't matter when you do this, but pick a consistent time and find a structure that works for you. And then throughout the day, I set reminders to pray. And these reminders remind me to pray. Number three, use scriptures in your prayer. Because prayer is a conversation, we need to hear God speak through his word and then respond in prayer. We can respond to what we read in Scripture through prayer. We can also allow Scripture to teach us to pray using the Psalms or using the prayer, prayer that Jesus taught as a pattern for prayer. Listen, there are two words that are very powerful when used in prayer. And these words are, you said. You said. In Genesis 31, God makes a promise to Jacob. And involved in that promise is one of the most faith-giving promises in Scripture that says, I will be with you. And then later when Jacob was in a deep crisis, he said, God, you said you will be with me. Right? That is a faith-filled prayer based on the promises of God. The fuel to pray, the thing that ignites you to pray is the promises of God. Remind God in prayer of what he has said and call him to be faithful to his word. Attaching God's promises to people, to situations, is the very backbone of all faith-filled life. There's a PDF out there. If you want it, I can email it to you by name of a guy named Tim Kerr who's compiled and categorized scripture promises and prayers in his book, Take Words With You. And he uses things to how do you pray in the middle of discouragement, scripture passages. How do you pray um, for your family? And you can, go, you can actually Google it and find a P free PDF. It's a great, great tool. It's like 80 pages of just scripture to pray over certain things that are going on in your life. And in case you need motivation to pray, let me share you some reasons why you should pray. Number one, God responds to the prayers of his people. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and wonderful results. James 5 teaches us that. It is through prayer that his work is accomplished on his earth. If my people would humble themselves, seek my face and pray, then I will hear from heaven. It is through prayer that God moves. God, 
Paul, the Apostle Paul continually asked for prayer whenever he was journeying on a missionary journey and saw prayer as a vital to his success. Friends, prayer is vital to our walk with Jesus, to our growth. Number two, God reveals himself to us through prayer. Psalm 143 says this, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. That's a prayer that David is praying. We learn more and more about his character and his perfect will, how it's working out in our lives through prayer, deepening our understanding of God, also deepens our faith and desire to worship. Number three, God imparts understanding through prayer. James 1 says it this way, if you need wisdom, if you want to know what God is telling you to do, ask him. Basically pray, and he will tell you. He will not resent your asking, the New Living Translation says. As we become increasingly aware of our limitations, our weaknesses, our struggles, we can rest in the knowledge that our God is omniscient, that he knows everything. Availing ourselves to God's counsel is a blessing of prayer. Number four, God gives us his power to resist temptation. Keep alert and pray. Otherwise, temptation will overcome you. For though the spirit is willing, the body is weak, Jesus said. With prayer, you have always have this proven shield of protection that's available. Just say the word. Just cry for help. Just plead for God to intervene. And he loves you enough to care for you. Peter says it this way, cast all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. God extends his power to us through prayer that we would be able to resist temptation. Number five, God does the impossible through prayer. Matthew 21, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. What are those things in your life that seems impossible right now? What are those things that you seem like there is no answer? God says, I can move it. I can change it. Our hearts our hearts begin to pound with great confidence as we take mighty tasks to our great God. He exercises his authority and ability to do the impossible through the prayers of his people. Number six, God invites us to bring our burdens to him. Jesus said this, come to me all who are weak and carry heavy burdens. And when you do, what I promise is I will give you rest. We have a heavenly father who is more than able to bring victory to any challenge. He is a spiritual and a physical healer. And like any healthy relationship, you have to keep that line of communication open. Number seven, God commands us to pray. Jeremiah 29 says it this way, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me in earnest, you will find me when you seek me. God wants to be in a relationship with us. He knows what we need, and he knows that we need what only he can give. And therefore, through prayer, we experience life-transforming, life-renewing intimacy with the creator of the universe. But I'll be honest, I still feel like a prayer beginner. I can imagine not being able to pray, though. I can imagine not going to Jesus with the things in my life. Prayer is one of the greatest privileges we have. As children of God, we have access to the Father anytime, anywhere. We know that when we pray, God hears us, that God cares for us, and he invites us to live a life in his presence. He cares for us and wants to live us to live our life on dependence on him. And through prayer, you can learn to be honest and to bring all of our messiness into the presence and the power of God, who not only cares, but he is willing and able to help. Number two is prayer. Number three, pursue worship and fellowship within the church community. Listen, I'll be the first to admit, sometimes church doesn't look like much. Church is a collection of people who don't have much in common, who are struggling through their lives just like I'm struggling. And when we gather, most of what we do feels like normally fairly routine things, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe it seems a little strange. And not only that, churches are often inconvenient, they're messy, they're uncomfortable. Add to this, a lot of us in this room have been hurt and disappointed by church. And it's no surprise either because churches are full of sinners, pastors included. But don't let the ordinariness of church fool you. There's a lot more going on in this room than you and I can see. The church has always been messy and humble, and yet it's, 
simultaneously more glorious than you and I can ever imagine. Jesus calls us in this room the bride of Christ, loved and cherished by Jesus himself. That's us, the church. 1 Corinthians says that we are his body. We are the expression of his physical presence here on earth. It is the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a foundation of truth. The gospel says the church, the scripture says the church is a sign, a foretaste, an instrument of God's kingdom on this earth. It makes the gospel visible. Jesus himself established the church, and the Christian life in the New Testament takes place in the context of the church. There is no way to live the Christian life apart from the commitment to and the participation in the life of the church. Friends, we need the church. We're meant to grow and serve in the context of a fellowship of other believers. We can't live the Christian life on our own. Let me just give you some pieces of advice. Number one, be plugged in. Be plugged in. Don't be here simply because you enjoy it. Don't be a consumer of goods and services, and when you become discontent, move on to the next church. That's not healthy. And all you're going to do is you're going to move from one place to the next place, never building community, never growing in your walk with Jesus. Some days you will love being here. Some days you'll hate being here. But be here because God's called you to be here. This is what Jesus is calling you. Be here and plugged in week in, week out because the gospel is preached. The gospel is prayed and sung and celebrated and taught and applied and lived and loved. Be here because you see that we take the Bible seriously and follow its command for church, that we practice regularly baptism and communion, that we have godly leaders. We sometimes have to practice church discipline, correcting sin in the life of congregation because we love them. We care for them. Be here and plugged in to, to be engaging in community and mission. Be here and plugged in for, and look for opportunities to serve and pray and study and be encouraged and encourage others along the way, even throughout the week, not just in the context of Sunday morning. Be here and plugged in as we try to create a gospel culture, one that incarnates the biblical message and the relationships and the vibe, the feel, the tone, the values, the priorities, the aroma, the honesty, the freedom, the gentleness, the humility, the cheerfulness, indeed the total human reality of a church that is defined and sweetened by the gospel of Jesus day in and day out. Be here and plugged in, not because we are perfect, in fact, can I tell you, we will never be perfect. Why? Two reasons. One, you've got an imperfect pastor, and then number two, because you're here. We'll never be perfect. Listen, if I sat down with one, each of you and said, hey, if you could give me a list of ways that we can be better as a church, each of you might have at least a list of three to four pages, right? And I'm grateful because if you sat me down, my list would be like 10 pages. And so you're gracious to me. I'm grateful that you're not expecting me to be perfect. And in our imperfectness together, Jesus is glorified. Not saying that we don't strive for excellence, but saying that the purpose of coming here isn't because everything is perfect. The purpose of coming here is because God has called us to be one family with one Lord. That's why we're here. Number two, show up. That doesn't sound like much, but friends, it's important. The ministry of showing up is important for two reasons. And it's, the writer of Hebrews says it. Number one, because you need it. Because you need it. You need to show up. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, because he who has promised is faithful. You need to be in community to be reminded of the hope that you have. Number two, when you show up, you show up because others need it. Others need to see you. Others need to be encouraged by you. Others need to be prayed for by you. Others need to be loved by you. Hebrews 10, again, 24, 25. Let us consider how to stir one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging, what one, encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Friends, you rob yourself and you rob others when you don't join others for worship. If church is as important as Scripture says it is, it is meant to be a priority for our lives. Number two, engage. Number three, engage in key practices. Studies show that the traits that correspond, these are the traits that correspond with growth. Bible engagement, obeying God, denying self, serving God and serving others, sharing about Jesus, 
exercising faith, seeking God, building relationships, being unashamed and transparent, transparent. All of those things are traits that correspond with you growing in your walk with Jesus. They've also shown behaviors that lead to these growths. Things like confessing sins to one another, attending worship services, getting involved in ministries and projects so that others can be blessed, discipling, mentoring others, praying for church leaders, participating in Bible studies and groups, and more. Most of the traits require you participating in the life of the church. It shouldn't surprise you that these behaviors lead to growth since they're consistent with the commands of Scripture. Build habits that help you engage in these behaviors. Our community groups are one of the primary ways in which we experience community as a body of believers. Listen, we believe in the vital importance of Sunday mornings. We do. This is where God's Word is taught. This is where our kids are taught in nursery. This is where we practice ordinances of communion and baptism, and we do that. But we don't typically find community or enter into deeper or more meaningful relationships with other Christians simply by attending on a Sunday morning. The dimensions of growing can only be experienced in the context of smaller gatherings through the week. These are what we call community groups in our church, and they gather regularly during the week, throughout the week. Some of them meet weekly, some bi-weekly. Other, church call, other churches will call these pl- groups called life groups or small groups or gospel communities, but they are the church meeting in homes where Christ is exalted, life is shared, spiritual growth is, growth is facilitated, mission is pursued, and community is cultivated in the power of the Holy Spirit with others who know and love Jesus. These groups in and of themselves are not local churches, but they are smaller embodiments of missional expressions of one local body known as Off City Church. Our community group should be the front lines where pastoral care happens. In other words, they're the primary places where individual members of our body are known to each other. They're loved, they're cared for, they're fed, they're provided for by the church body. That's what they should be. It's where you come and just do life together. I sent a survey out this week asking what you guys thought about community groups. I'm going to pick on one of you guys simply just so I could address this. One of you guys said that we don't do much in community groups. That's the point. Because we do a lot all the time. The point is just come. Just be. Just eat. Just fellowship. It doesn't have to be more than that. It is just do life. Just be refreshed so that you can go and live your life for Jesus. Our community groups are where you should be able to invite a coworker or a classmate to come and say, hey, come and see what a body of believers look like who are completely different, but they share a meal together. They laugh together. They joke together. They genuinely care for each other. When someone is hurting, they pray for each other. And they see that. They see what community looks like. They want to say, I want more. Right? We've seen this happen in our communities. We've seen, she's not here, but we've seen a young girl come to one of our community groups for months before she ever showed up in our church here. She wasn't a follower of Jesus when she showed up there, but now she's on fire for Jesus. Why? Because she saw what the church was supposed to look like. Our community groups are supposed to be safe places where your friends can come and just say, man, this is what believers look like. This is what lovers of Jesus look like. Not what the political news circles are saying, what Christians look like, but this is genuinely what followers of Jesus look like. These guys look like each other. They think differently politically. They think differently about um, where our country is headed. They think differently. Um, They they come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. They come from different cultural backgrounds. But they're all sitting around this table, and they're laughing and sharing, and they're just enjoying life together. Man, what is that? That's the church. That's the body of Jesus. How do I find that? How do I get plugged in? How do I get involved? In addition to our community groups, we strongly encourage you guys to be involved in a Bible study. These are typically formed out of one community group, ideally consists of three to four men, three to four women of the same gender who meet regularly for three things, accountability, encouragement, or prayer. Being involved in both a community group and a Bible study enables you to experience the spiritual dynamics of the larger community of believers 
as well as the benefits that come from a more personal and relational engagement with just a handful of Christians. Community groups are primarily meant for community. Bible study groups are primarily meant for discipleship, and both of which flow significantly together for our growth. All of this is meant to prepare us to be on mission infused with gospel intentionality where we seek not only to share the gospel message with people far from God, but also to build meaningful relationships with them as well as to introduce them to Christian community so that the community that is formed by the, po- by the gospel can work powerfully in concert with the message of the gospel. And in this way, the gospel message is magnified as people that are far from God are able to consistently observe people who are just passionately in love with Jesus. And so we believe community flourishes well when it's best allowed to emerge and develop according to the unique giftings and interests of those involved. But regardless of the special emphasis that you may pursue, we want to encourage you, be in community, be in Bible studies, to make room for these values, values of worship and discipleship and community and mission. Maybe your community group gets together and you pray a lot. That's awesome. Do it. Maybe another community group is called to reach out to a particular neighborhood or a school or work with a refugee ministry like Dallas is doing or find or help pack food for starving children around the world like Colin just did. Do that. And yet another group may find that their emphasis is we get together, we share requests, we pray and encourage each other. That's wonderful. We encourage you. Get into a group. Grow in your walk with Jesus. Encourage one another. This is where you get to use your spiritual gifts to bless the body. You are not a participant on this ride. You're called to be engaged. I need one last reason, and this is selfish. Participate so that your pastor is happy. That sounds self-serving, but it's not about me. And here's why it's not about me. Hebrews 13 says this. Obey your leaders, submit to them. Listen to these words. Because they watch over your souls, and they will have to give an account. Right? I have to give an account for you guys. And so in humility, I say grow. Not because you can... Selfishly, because I don't want Jesus yelling at me. I don't think he will, but... um, Because I want to hear that the people that Jesus has brought into my life, I've seen you guys grow. That you're not just content with just simply showing up. But remember that we, your pastors, are people who need the ministry of the church as well. You don't just need me and the others to speak up here. We need you. Live in such a way that you give us grace. Contribute toward building a gospel culture within the church. We all need the ministry of the church. We need its preaching. We need its teaching. We need its ordinances. We need its relationships. We need its messiness. We need its inconveniences. It helps us get us over ourselves. Even more, others in the church need us. We have a role to play in God's church. All of us in this room are ministers, and we rob others of grace when we withhold the gifts that God has given us. There is no substitute for regular, joyful, sacrificial participation in the life of the church, even when, especially when, it's costly. Back in the day, like way back in the day, I used to go to the gym with my college roommates. Way back in the day. I sometimes noticed in the gym that my roommate was struggling with an exercise that I found very easy, right? He was breaking a sweat. He's exhausted. He's drinking water. And I'm like, why are you struggling? This thing is so easy. The answer was he was doing the exercise right. (laughs) I wasn't. I was trying to find as many workaways around simply to say I did it and get out of there as quickly as possible. Unless I'm careful, I can rush through an exercise without engaging 
the muscle groups that it was intended to strengthen. I was going through the motions. He was engaging the core. He was working harder. He was also seeing the benefit. He saw the fruit of doing things right. I didn't, and as you can see, I quit. It's not enough to read or listen to the Bible, to pray or pursue worship or um, fellowship within the church community. If we miss the point, these practices can become dangerous, not helpful. If you simply care about doing them for the sake of doing, you'll become like the Pharisees with the Je who Jesus condemned in Scripture. You'll become proud and arrogant. If we read scriptures just to check off a box, if we pray without pursuing the God who we are praying to, if we attend church out of routine or obligation or guilt rather than intentionally engaging with those around us, friends, you will not grow and you will conclude that these practices will not work. Of course, can I say, you still read the Bible and you still go to church even when you don't feel like it, but they, you should be aiming for genuine, heartfelt, earnest engagement with those core habits that goes far beyond just going through the motions of engagement. Don't practice these habits by simply going through the motions. Engage your core. Seek God, not just the habits themselves. I've never met someone who's encountered God's grace and who's practiced these habits from the heart, reading and listening to the word, praying, pursuing worship and community who hasn't grown. I've never met someone who's done these things who hasn't grown. Conversely, I've never met a single person who has grown without engaging these three habits. These are the foundational habits that you and I are called to practice for the rest of our lives. We never get beyond them. They shape us and help us grow into the joyful pursuit of God and in love for others. One last illustration, I'm done. When Daniel wanted to learn karate in the classical movie Karate Kid, he was given this um, unusual task by Mr. Miyagi, his teacher, right? He was given a series of menial tasks. He would say, go wax the car. Go sand a wooden floor. Go refinish a fence. Go repaint a house. And young Daniel would get frustrated. He didn't see the connection between the task and karate. The assignments, though, trained Daniel both in his muscles and in his mind. Daniel's muscle memory allowed him to unexpectedly triumph when he competed in a tournament. He mastered the basic movements and he developed discipline. And friends, it made all the difference in what he was supposed to do. The habit of reading and listening to the Bible, the habit of praying and pursuing worship and engaging in community, they don't seem like much. Like I said, a lot of these things you've heard your entire life will be tempted to see them as menial and ordinary and to think that they're a waste of time. But if you will develop and practice these core habits, I guarantee you, you will experience more of God's grace and pleasure in your life. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things, and you will know that God is with you.